Right, I have it at 12 o'clock, so we'll kick off. Thank you, everyone, and good afternoon, and welcome to this session of our series of webinars on EU exit, uh, and this one in particular for continuing airworthiness management organisations. Uh, my name is Will Nathan. I'm Head of External Relations here at the UK Civil Aviation Authority. Uh, you can find the full list of our webinar series on our dedicated microsite, which I'm sure you're all well familiar with now, um, at info.caa.co.uk forward slash EU exit, although I have to say that this is one of the final ones in those in those series. Um, today we'll be hearing from Steve Horton, Mark Wallace and Stuart Alger on the issues affecting continuing maintenance organizations in a no deal scenario. Um, there'll be time at the end of this webinar for a Q&A uh, and you can submit your questions using the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen as opposed to putting your hands up. So we won't be taking verbal questions, only written questions. And I really would encourage you to, to wait to submit those questions until towards the end of the webinar as many of those questions will probably be answered throughout the session. I have to say that there are lots of people attending this session today, so it's unlikely we'll be able to get to all questions, uh, but we will do our best. Where we don't, in the allotted half an hour at the end of this session, uh, we will follow up uh, with an email to you answering your question, so long as you provide, so long as you don't answer that question anonymously, uh, and you ask, answer it using your full name, uh, which will register your email address, and we can send you a response. Uh, and finally, just so you're aware, we will be recording this session and we'll be making the slides available afterwards. Uh, next slide please. And just to before we get into the substance just to quickly talk you through the agenda today we'll be covering the new regulatory framework as at the 1st of January 2021 at the end of the transition period. We'll be talking about continued validity of UK Part M approvals and what you guys need to do to be prepared for the 1st of January 2021. We'll also be talking about what needs to be approved by the CAA uh, and then specific information to Part M organizations, uh, the aircraft transfer as transfers and leasing and Part M documentation and records before we move on to that final Q&A session. Uh, and with that, I pass over to my colleague Steve Horden, who will talk you through the new regulatory framework. Okay, good, good afternoon all. Um, can I have the first slide, please? Okay. The UK formally left the EU on the 31st of January, at the beginning of this year, following the ratification of the UK EU withdrawal agreement. So we are now in what is termed a transition period, which takes us up to the 31st of December. During this time, all the EU agreements, that's including the BASAs and the Aviation Key, continue to apply to us here in the UK. And you may be well aware that the negotiations for a long term UK EU aviation relationship are continuing at this time. But the UK will no longer be a participant in the EASA system after this transition period ends at the end of the year. Next slide, please. Now, the European Union Withdrawal Act, um, EU legislation that will form part of. UK domestic law, if it is in force and in effect on the 31st of December, and that is quite an important point about being in force and in effect. The EU Aviation Key will be brought across under the Withdrawal Act into UK law. Now you may have heard the term statutory instrument or SI. There are numerous SIs that have been made under the Act to make the legislation operable in the UK. But the substantive requirements of the EU reg regulations remain unchanged. So the technical content of the regulations do not change. Also, there is no change to the identity of the regulations. So the reference numbers or the regulation numbers that you know today do not change once we go past into next year. So we retain the same identity. Next slide, please. So at the end of this transition period, we will be responsible for the development of our own aviation safety policy and regulation. And we are establishing that capability to do this work from the start of 2021. Now this does provide us with an opportunity to develop our own safety policy and to better involve industry in the decision making and to develop our rules more flexibly. 
there will be an annual published program of change derived from prioritization of the various demands that exist. And we are currently developing our program for 2021, and that will be published towards the end of this year. The 2021 changes at the moment will likely to contain um, implementation of in-train EU regulation and the implementation of ICAO SARPs with some deregulatory measures and some um, additional items for general aviation. Next slide, please. So I'll, I'll then pass over to um, Mark to take you through the Part M approval changes. Good afternoon. Next slide then, please. So this is just to reiterate what Steve's mentioned um, and, and Will at the beginning. All of these slides are based on uh, a preparation for no agreement. Next slide, please. So this, this confirms um, your, the validity of the of your camo approval after the 31st of December this year. So your, your approval will remain valid as it was granted by the UKCA as a competent authority for continuing airworthiness. You won't need to uh, make an application to process or, or do anything other um, to get your to keep your UK approval and your reference will remain unchanged. Um, the only applications that you will need to make going forward will be for part camo. Your certificate will also remain uh, in force and, and valid until such time as the certificate needs to change uh, through variation. Next slide. So what do you need to do? You'll need to carry out a review of the work that your organisation is doing and, and work of uh, and work that is being carried out for your organisation to understand if it's been impacted by the, the end of the transition period. You'll need to include changes to your exposition and other documentation related to Brexit in the next routine uh, revision. So we're not asking you to uh, send in your exposition straight away with any other changes. Um, they can be done at the next routine revision. You'll also need to engage with your MROs carrying out your maintenance to ensure that they have a controlled procedure which ensures only the appropriate licensed certifying staff and the support staff exercise their privilege on G registered aircraft. Next slide. So what are the CAA going to approve? So the CA will implement any necessary formatting changes to your approval certificate and we'll do that on a rolling basis as and when such amendments arise. So you don't need to do anything further with that. Uh, and the inclusion of any amended approval certificates, uh, i.e. Form 1s or anything else like that, don't need to be included in, uh, until your next revision of your, your exposition. So we'll go through uh, what aircraft um, part M organisations will be able to manage going forward. So you'll see the table in front uh, has a UK MG approve, uh, an organisation has a UK MG approval, and you'll be able to continue to manage G registered aircraft and issue and extend ARCs. If you are looking after an EU registered aircraft and you've got a UK MG approval, you will need to apply for an EAS, a third country approval, before you can continue to manage that aircraft or issue and extend ARCs. If you've got a UK Part M camo approval, again, you'll be able to continue to manage and ex issue and extend ARCs on G registered aircraft, but for EU aircraft, you would require a third country approval. If you've got an EASA MG organisation um, looking after a G registered aircraft, they may continue to, to do that as long as they hold their MG approval. And they, they can obviously look after EU aircraft as well. If you've got an, a, a, an EASA uh, organisation looking after your G registered aircraft and they have got a part camo approval issued after the 31st of December, they may no longer look after or manage the G registered aircraft. They can uh, continue to manage and issue and extend 
parks on EU registered aircraft. For subcontracted activities, there is no change um, as the subcontractor works under the approval and quality system of the CAMO in question. So you can continue to use other organisations. Uh, and a, a one, for 145 organisations, a CAMO manager in a G registered aircraft will need to ensure that the part 145 maintenance organisation has a control process to ensure the validity of the certified engineer's licence. Next slide. So transfer of aircraft, aircraft imported from the EU member state, we will, the UK will continue to accept a valid ARC and C of A as, as transfer documentation. If you're exporting an aircraft from the UK into the EU, uh, that should be considered to be an export from a third country and therefore uh, MA904 is applicable and the aircraft will require an export C of A. Next slide. So I'll hand you over to Stuart for this one. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I've just got one slide to cover, and it's just looking at the changes in uh, or the impact of, for aircraft leasing for dry lease ins and dry lease outs and wet lease in and out. Um, so the main change or that you would be likely to see, and also especially a ramp up in activity, will be around Part T approvals. Although the Part T approval is not new, that now, because everybody is considered a, we are a third country to the EU and EU member states will be third countries to us. So if you're going to dry lease in an aircraft for a period of time, you will need now need to pursue and, and gain a Part T approval. So, and that's unless, that's just only for applicable for licensed air carriers. Um, and it's only where the continuing airworthiness has not been delegated to the UK. And the other significant change for, for dry lease in and the same for dry lease out is the is the maximum lease period where currently it's it's seven months with the option to extend it to well, a further five months whereas that five month extension will no longer be be allowed so the maximum lease period for dry lease in or for dry lease out will be seven months um, and then again not really changes but it's just sort of clarifies the UK position that the aircraft will need to be equipped uh, in accordance with UK air operation regulations rather than EU air operation regulations and also the the operational need cannot be satisfied through leasing a UK registered aircraft whereas before you as an operator you had to demonstrate that the uh, the operational need couldn't be uh, satisfied with a with an EU registered aircraft and then the compliance as applicable with the relevant parts of 1321 for, for part M and part 145 um, requirements as applicable. And sort of mentioned the dry lease out period, it still is, is, is again, is, is reduced to the, a maximum of seven months to, to EU member states as well. So uh, the wet lease in, again, not really changes, but it's just how it flips onto the UK side, side of things really, is that the uh, for a wet lease in of an aircraft, that the, the the safety standards for the of the third country operator for continuing air of continuing airworthiness and air operations are equivalent to uh, to 1321. So the an assessment would have to be made by the CAMO, and it will have to be agreed and accepted by the UK CAA that the the aircraft meets the applicable you know, equivalent of Part M and 145 requirements. And for wet lease outs, there's there's no changes. So that's it. Thank you. Next slide, thanks. Um, so for documentation and records, uh, a CAMO manager and a G registered aircraft will need to establish whether the type certificate or the supplemental type certificate is valid that they want to use or as they've got on their aircraft. Um, if you're managing a G registered aircraft, you must ensure that all airworthiness directives are applicable to that aircraft have been reviewed and where appropriate compliance demonstrated. That would be state of design and state of registration. And a CAMO managing a G registered aircraft must ensure that any new or used parts fitted have a valid form one or equivalent. This will become a bit clearer later on. Um, I've got some flow diagrams to go through to, to explain some of this in a bit more detail. Next slide. So is the type certificate valid for my G registered aircraft? So has a UK type certificate been issued? If the answer is yes, 
then it is valid as per the normal process um, and we may uh, issue uh, flight manuals or MMELs or um, a supplement to the TC holders docs. So that's accepted. If the answer is no to the UK TC being issued, was the TC issued and signed before the 1st of January 2021 in accordance with the EASA part 21? If the answer to that is yes, then no changes, flight manual and MML will be as uh, previously uh, the 31st of December. So it's accepted. If the answer is no, has the TC been issued by one of our bilateral partners? If the answer to that is yes, then the bilateral rules apply. And again, it's accepted. If the answer to that is no, then you need to contact the UK CAA. Next slide. So is the STC valid for my G registered aircraft? Has the UK uh, CAA issued an, an STC? If the answer to that is yes, then it's accepted. If the answer to that is no, was the STC approval issued and signed before the 1st of January 2021? If the answer to that is yes, then it's accepted. If the answer to that is no, then is the, uh, is the answer the state of design for the responsible DOA? If the answer to that is yes, did the DOA issue the STC? If the answer to that is no, then you need to contact the UK CAA. If the answer to that is yes, then was the DOA approved prior to the 31st of December? If the answer to that is no, contact the UK CAA. If it's yes, then uh, it's accepted valid due to the recognition period. Is the uh, state of design responsible to DOA? No, then is it an STC from a DOA in a state we have a bilateral with? If the answer is yes, bilateral rules apply. If the answer is no, then to contact the UK CAA. Can I fit this part to my G registered aircraft? Does the organization have the capability for the parts? If the answer is no, then it's not accepted as per normal. If the answer is yes, are the components released on a UK CAA form one? If that's yes, then you can accept the, the component. If the answer is no, then are the components released on a form one from an EASA or EASA third country approval? If it's yes, you can accept them. If it's no, you can't use them, not accepted. Next slide. So can the UK CAMO maintaining my G registered aircraft use uh, an EASA approved 145 organization? So does the 145 have the capability to carry out the work required? If the answer is no, then you can't accept, you can't use that organization. If the answer is yes, did the organization gain their EASA approval prior to the 1st of January, 2021? If the answer is no, then does the organization hold a UK 145 approval? If the answer is no, it's not accepted. If the answer is yes, then you can use that company. If the organization gained their approval prior to the 1st of January, 2021, uh, will the ASA will the 145 company be using practice three? Yes. Is the work being carried out on a G registered aircraft within the UK? If the answer is yes, then you can't use that. That's not accepted. If the answer is no, then the ASA 145 MRO may be used and a CRS statement must be in accordance with the CAA policy decision. That's the end of the presentation. Great. Thank you, Mark, um, and thank you everyone for listening. I hope you found it an informative uh, session. We will, as I said at the top of the call, we will now move to the Q&A session where we'll work through the, the questions that have been submitted so far. And if you do have any further questions, please submit them now. We've only had a couple at the moment, so um, I'm expecting a few more to come in. Uh, but 
to that. I think the first one, if it's okay, Steve will come to you. Um, there is an EASA rule amendment due to be published by the end of 2020 to postpone the requirement to carry 25 hours duration CVR to 1st January 2022. Will this postponement be carried over into UK law? Okay, the, the decision um, that's been um, actioned by EASA actually moves it um, the in the applicable date into next year um, so that currently the requirement still sits this year um, we are well aware of the of the change um, posed by um, EASA and by ICAO and we are actively looking at it now as to what we can do in in ourselves um, to actually extend it as well so um, please um, keep an eye on things and uh, we'll let you know as soon as we've we've been able to do do what we need to do. Great, thanks Steve. Um, Mark, it is understood that permit to flyers will be issued by the UK CAA or the Part M CAMO organisation if they have the privilege. Are there any further actions or considerations that need to be taken into account for flying an aircraft under a permit to fly from the non-UK country into the UK uh, as organisations may be flying over Europe departing from an EASA member state? No, it's just standard um flight conditions uh, and the permit and then you just need to get your overflight permissions from any other country that you're you're overflying great thank you um i think this one's been a bit of a point of clarification that a couple of people or participants have brought up and it's this question about um arcs and easa tco approved camos in the uk whether they maintain the privilege to issue arcs to easa registered aircraft after the end of the transition period can you confirm the caa's understanding of this as, uh, as um, the regulations state that a camo must have its primary place of business in a member state to hold ARC privileges. Should I take that one, Mark? Yep, got him. Okay, the, yes, the, um, um, if, if it's, a, I'll do it in two ways. U, a UK um, camo will not be able to issue ARCs on a EU registered aircraft after the 31st of December. Um, it will only be for um, UK registered aircraft. If they hold a third country approval, that's not our decision. That will be up to um, EASA to make that call as to what they can and cannot do. Um, if it's a EU, if it's a camo in the EU, then we are issuing a document to enable them to continue to use their approval to manage um, uh, G-registered aircraft. Great, thanks Steve. I think we'll stay with you for the next one as well and it's a question about whether um, the acceptance of EASA third country form ones, um, do, do, do UK based, uh, are they acceptable to UK based EASA third country organisations? So accepting? Uh, accepting EASA third country form ones. Okay, um, here in the UK, we will accept um, EASA Form 1s, no matter where they come from, as long as uh, it's not a third country approval of a UK organisation. So we will recognise the EASA Form 1 for up to two years, but not from a, uh, an organisation here in the UK issuing EASA Form 1s. So I hope that answers the question. Great, thanks Steve. Um, and can you accept a new component if issued with an FAA 81303? Yes. That was simple. Thanks, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> um, here's, a, here's a longer one, which is a follow up, I believe, from uh, some of the webinars we held last week on bilateral agreements and specifically on the FAA agreement. At the webinar last week, it was mentioned that the CAA will not be accepting FAA AMOX under the US UK bilateral agreement. This is a significant change for UK operators and poses an operational risk due to delays in obtaining a UK CAA AMOC. What is the rationale behind this, given the CAA has already baselined UK camos to comply with ADs issued by State of Design? How will these operational risks be mitigated by the CAA? I think that is going to have to be one that we'll answer outside of this meeting. I, I don't think I haven't got the details of that, so we need to take that one away and come back with a, a written response on that one. 
Great, thanks, Steve. Um, and while we're on the point of or the question of bilaterals, uh, do we have plans for a UK or do we have any uh, bilateral agreements with Indonesia? Not yet. And as, a, as far as I know, we don't have anything in the pipeline at the moment. Um, bilaterals will be um, a DFT decision as to the priorities on countries. So that's that'll be a, a, a government decision. OK. Uh, in the during the part 145 webinar, um, the CAA mentioned camo verification of major changes issued by EASA DOAs if CAA approval is required. While we understand negotiations are ongoing with the EU, do you have any proposals on what camo verification or maintenance and design data would look like? Is that one for you, Steve? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Mark. Uh, um, not, not at this at this time. Um, again, I think that's we are working on a lot of this behind the scenes. So that's another one I think we will have to take away. Thanks, Steve. Um, Mark, how would the part camo be validated by the UK CAA? How would the part camo be validated by the CAA? I'm not sure. I've so a part camo approval would be issued. Um, by the UK CAA on application. Um, when will the UK CRS for practice three be available for an ERSA part 145 releasing a G-Reg aircraft outside the UK? We will be, we'll be publishing the, the decision on that um, before Christmas. Um, but basically the, the CRS statement is in 145 we haven't changed the technical content of 145 so it's in there but we have also we will also be publishing an alternative uh, in case the local authority has uh, problems with that so there, there will be two statements uh, that can be used and they will be published um, probably about around about early mid December great thank you there's a follow-up question on the matter of bilaterals and it's whether whether parts from any state where the UK has a bilateral agreement, for instance, the USA, Canada, et cetera, will they be accepted by the UK CAA? Yes, where we've got a bilateral. Where we've got a bilateral, they will be accepted. Be accepted yes. Yep. Great, thank you. Um, you stated that an EASA aircraft with valid C of A and ARC, it would not need an export, just a transfer. Transfer. The CAA website states only if ARC issued prior to the 31st of December 2021. Is this still a limiting factor or is a 2021 ARC valid to transfer into the UK? Uh, I'll leave that one to Steve, I think. Thanks. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, it's that is the was the stated position that we published earlier um all they are decisions that we are going to publish in december they're currently up for review at the moment to bring them up to date so that's i'm not saying it will change but it is under review thank you um if you have an easa part 145 organization that was issued it's easa 145 prior to the end of the transition period but has a type added post january 2021 is this accepted by the UK CAA or for work on UK registered aircraft or would the organization then need a UK CAA approval for that type only? Uh, this is, I, I'm just going to say with this one, this is, is a, a very uh, challenging question that we are facing at the moment um, about the recognition of um, approvals going forward. Um, because the the uh, transition the recognition um, requirements in the SI uh, fixes the approval as of the 31st of December so um, it is something we are currently looking at and within the next two to three weeks you will get an answer on on that one uh, that will will give you the full details I think it's fair to say on that one, Steve, that we'll be updating our microsite with further details and we'll be sending out a, a Skywise alert to accompany it. Um, what is the process for obtaining a UK part 145 approval and how long does it take? Uh, the, the, the process is to make an application through uh, the UK CA website. Um, 
can't give a definitive time for how long that would take. It depends on the, the uh, quality of the submission and what's being asked for. Great, thanks. I think, Steve, this one might be one for you. What's the expected lag between EASA publishing a regulation amendment, say to 1321-2014, and the UK CAA being able to make these requirements applicable to UK-based CAMOs or MROs? The, the rulemaking process going forward, uh, there is no automatic uplift of a change to the EASA regulations into UK regulations. Every regulation will be reviewed and it may or may not be up, um, brought into UK law. It may or may not be brought in the same format. So um, the, the, the content of change, the speed of change, that is purely down to us. And there is no guarantees as to what those changes will be, but it will be done in full consultation with uh, the relevant stakeholders. Thank you. Uh, and will the UKCA be migrating towards EASA Part Camo to allow similar standards across EASA? So uh, Part, Part Camo is uh, already uh, applicable. Um, so yes, when, when uh, people make their application for a Part Camo approval, it will be to the current EASA regulations. Thank you. Um, am, I under, am I understanding the correct following? A UK G registered aircraft based and maintained by a, a 145 company outside the UK may be certified by that company and accepted by a UK camo. Is that statement true? Sorry, can you just go through that again? Of course, of course. Um, a UK G registered aircraft based and maintained by a part 145 company outside the UK may be certified by that company and accepted by a UK camo. Yes. Great, thank you. Um, and will, uh, will uh, organisations have to reissue all base maintenance contracts for Brexit and, and then again for part camo? Uh, certainly not for part camo. Um, what I would say is that you need to review your maintenance contracts and make sure that that uh, for the uh, end of the transition period that they are accurate and work for for you as a camo and that you are able to have oversight of the 145 uh, maintenance contracts. Great, thanks, Mark. I think this is another one for you. Um, this organisation is currently in the early stages of transferring an aircraft with an FAA type certificate from a non-EU member state. If the transfer is completed after the end of the year, so the end of the transition period, will the aircraft be transferred as per the bilateral agreement? So it's an aircraft with an FAA type certificate from a non-EU member state. Yes, the bilateral would apply. Great, thank you. Um, Steve, perhaps this is one for you. You mentioned the, well, someone mentioned the, the IASA Part 145 having appropriate licenses and controls. Does that mean having an IASA Part 66 license? So is that uh, uh, an EU 145 or UK? Yeah, one? yeah. So EU. An, uh, a EU 145, um, they can still, uh, they can use the, EU issued part 66 licenses um, and they will be recognized in accordance with um, uh, uh, appendix four. So they can use the local uh, issued licenses there. So there is no change in that respect with the use of uh, license holders. Great, thank you. Um, will the process of taking on a new EASA aircraft, a new European aircraft, follow the current policy of the ARC recommendations and approval being approved by manufacturer, be accepted by the UK CAA for, an, for issuance of an ARC certificate of airworthiness, et cetera? Uh, yes, there'll be some min minor tweaks to the, to the procedure, but uh, yes, the basic concepts remains the same. Thank you, Mark. Um, with regards to airworthiness directives, some state of design ADs have previously not been adopted by EASA. Please, can you confirm that the UK CAA will only adopt ADs in force currently or would historic non-adopted AEs, so that's those ADs that have not been adopted by Europe, 
require reviewing. Uh, obviously, um, this could have significant implications for organizations, says this participant. Okay, I'll, I'll take that one, Mark. Okay. Um, what we're doing with the, with the ADs, we are fixing the AD compliance uh, as of the 31st of December. Uh, there'll be a, a decision made uh, published on that. So the uh, compliance will be as is on the 31st of December for all um, ADs that were published or um, uh, by or a decision taken by EASA at that time. So the, the that fixes the the point then and then we move forward from that date um, to the uh, appropriate state of design and CIA ADs as appropriate. Great, thanks Steve. I think we'll stay with you for this one. Um, you, you mentioned that EASA Park Camo organisations will require UK CAA approval to manage G registered aircraft. Can you clarify about the recognition period? So that's the two year period of recognition of EASA certificates after the end of the transition period. Can the EASA Park Camo organisation continue to manage G registered aircraft for the next two years? That, that's it is correct. They can manage uh, G registered aircraft for up to two years. Uh, the recognition period um, in, that's in the statutory instrument recognises the approvals uh, that are um, valid um, or um, expire after the two year period. Um, we will be issuing a decision that recognises the CAMO to continue to uh, manage uh, G registered aircraft because the current um, Part M regulations don't allow that. So we've had to put something in place that will continue that recognition. Great, thank you. Um, Mark, on the subject of permits to fly, will flight conditions still need to be granted by EASA or will the UK CAA take this on? Uh, no, the UK CAA will uh, grant the flight conditions. And you stated that the exposition does not need to be submitted for approval, but we were told in another CAA presentation that the paragraph 2.16 and part 7 US bilateral sections will need to be updated to reflect the use of CAA form 1s by the 1st of January 2021. Uh, please, can one of you clarify this? Uh, so then it, the, the expositions will need to be updated, um, but we're not asking people to send them in uh, specifically for that update, they can send it in as part of an, an, uh, any other routine update. Thanks, Mark. Um, will EASA operation ops requirements, such as CAT IDE requirements, remain the same as remain the same after the end of the transition period as they are now? Yes, that's what we've uh, captured. Um, uh, a question here about documentation. Where would we find the document for EASA camos to manage G-Reg aircraft? That will be published um, uh, about mid-December and um, that will be published on our website so that will make it available. Great, thank you. Um, if a type certificate is EASA approved prior to the end of 2020, but revi uh, um, I think we've already I think we've already answered that question. Sorry, uh, in that we'll come back to it. Uh, we'll come back to you on that one shortly. It was a question about whether changes to the approval after the end of the transition period will be recognised. Um, further to the slide given today on importing an aircraft from the EU, can the CAA confirm that an export CFA will not be required for aircraft delivered, and will this be the case for the duration of the two-year recognition period? Uh, so, so air, aircraft delivered from from uh, the EU, i.e., an, an Airbus, if it's a brand new aircraft, uh, it would be done um, as as is today uh, with a Form Fifty Two and an X. But it would require an export actually. Um, and then if it's if it's a second hand aircraft transitioning in, um, as long as it's got a valid C of A and ARC, that we would accept that. Thank you, Mark. Um, will existing transfer of oversight agreements be transferred to ICAO 83 biz agreements? I'm not sure about that one, so forgive me if I got I, it wrong. I can, I can take that one. And so, how will uh, the process work after the end of the transition period? 
Okay, so I can take that one. So, so currently, the UK hasn't entered into, into any Article 83 biz agreements with any other states. Uh, it's something we may look at in the future, but currently we haven't done, and there is, yeah, we haven't done it at this moment in time. Great, thanks, Stuart. Um, Steve, will the UK CAA be automatically accepting FAA modifications approved via FAA 81103 slash 81009 as currently allowed under the FAA EASA tip? Um, you'd have to refer to the UK uh, US uh, tip, but I be believe that that should continue, but you would need to refer back to the, the relevant tip to check that. Thank you. Um, could one of you clarify that for EASA aircraft, where the OEM TC holder is in an EU member state, uh, where the TCDs is issued after the 1st of January 2021, will that, T, will, those T, will that TCDS therefore be accepted by the UK CAA, or will a UK TCDS be required from the 1st of January? For, for new aircraft coming out of the EU uh, with a new TCDS, um, then the, uh, there will be a CIA involvement and more than likely a, U a CIA TCDS to go with it. Great, thank you. Um, post the 31st of December 2020, just want to confirm whether we are accepting EASA transferable airworthiness re review certificates, re Irish CAA. So if the ARC is valid uh, and you transfer the aircraft, then um, we, we will revalidate the um, ARC on, when the aircraft transfers into the G-Reg. Thank you. Um, under the UK-Canada agreement, component maintenance is mutually acceptable up to and including complete engines and propellers. Therefore, a single Canadian release TCCA Form 1 on a repaired part is acceptable for installation onto a G-registered aircraft. Can you please confirm that? Uh, that's, that's a correct statement. That's just been yeah, clarified think, by Pete think, Prendergast. Yeah, I think, that, I think that's just a request for, for you guys to confirm. <laughs> so that's, that's good information. Just It's just for the wider audience that that's the, the correct release. A single Canadian TCA Form 1 would be used. Um, with the end of the transition period in mind, what is the impact for any UK camos that have not gained part camo approval before March 2021? Uh, and have they been caught in the bottleneck? Um, Steve, do you want to take this one? I'm not sure what the March 2021 refers to. Okay. Um, the, the, um, okay. Um, the, the subpart Gs are currently transfer transferring to a part camera approval um, and there is a uh, an end date next year um, which we will be because of the um, uh, pandemic situation this year we will be looking to moving that end date to enable that process to uh, be managed uh, much better than uh, trying to push them all into a small period of time I think that answers the question but the, but the transfer is still continuing is is the other part um does an organization need to have all aircraft tech logs replaced where they include the asa statement they certainly need to be updated yes Uh, Steve, perhaps one for you. With reference to acceptance of EASA Form 1s, we understand that these can be accepted and fitted to UK aircraft for up to two years. Could you confirm if the component was accepted into the organisation prior to the end of 2022, it could still be fitted post this date? Or, for example, if a component was accepted on the 1st of December 2022, it may only be used on the aircraft for the remaining 30 days of that month? I can't confirm that at this point. Um, the um, as we go forward um, past the 1st of January 2021, we will be looking at our approach and whether we continue to recognize the Form 1 into 2023. So um, that decision has yet to be made and I wouldn't like to give an answer that um, wasn't correct at this time. 
Thank you. Um, along with state of design AD compliance, will EASA ADs also need to be shown as complied with? Uh, just state of design and state of registry. So what you need to show compliance with. And how about FAA AD that EASA decided not to adopt? So I think Steve answered that earlier. We're not looking retrospectively on ADs. Okay. Um, will EASA ARCs issued by a UK CAMO in 2020 remain valid for any period of time if the aircraft transfers to an EASA authority after the December 31st, 2020? Or is the export certificate of airworthiness the only option for aircraft transfer to EASA after the 31st of December? Uh, so we'll become a third country after the 31st of December um, and EASA would expect um, an export C of A after that point. Thanks, Mark. This organisation currently uses a UK MRO to perform maintenance on its G registered aircraft. They have several maintenance bases around Europe and their part 145 approval has been issued by Switzerland. Will they be able to continue supporting the organisation's aircraft in the UK? Yes, the um, we are uh, recognising the Swiss um, as a CIA decision at, in December um, because the, Switzerland is not an EEA member state so we are um, that is already in play and will be published as I said around about mid-December so yes you can continue to use uh, Swiss um, approved organizations. Thanks, Steve. Uh, we'll stick to a, a scenario based question. This organization is not approved to do ARC reviews and currently uses an EASA based part M to perform review and make recommendations to the UK CAA. Can that continue or will that organization be required to hold a UK part M approval? Uh, I think we answered that one in the um, table at the beginning of the presentation. Do you want to just answer it now for, to, to clarify for the participant? So, yes, they can, as long as they've got a subpart G, remain subpart G, um, then they can continue for the recognition period. Uh, but if they transfer to part camo, then they, they can't after the trans, after the 31st of December. Um, is there any consideration underway at the UK CAA for extending the deadline for UK camos to transfer to part camo? Yes, we are reviewing um, that requirement. And if it's the case that EASA regulations will be reviewed and implemented by the UK CAA, how is it that an EASA camo can still issue ARCs after the 31st of December 2020 for UK registered aircraft, assuming that this participant has understood that statement correctly? Yes, he, he, the, that statement has been uh, understood correctly, um, but the um, the ability for us to change the regulation and diverge greatly from the ASA rules uh, in the early days is, is quite limited. So, um, the for the two year period, I do not see that we will there will be any difference um, in the approach uh, between us and a, 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 a EU um, based camo. Thanks, Steve. Um, there's a question here, which I think you've already answered, so forgive me, but is there any intention of the CAA reviewing its position about the UK's acceptance of EAS-approved EAS -approved camos in the future? A question about the level playing field here. It, it, that depend, I'm assuming we're talking now about as we go forward past the two year recognition yeah. period. Um, as, it, as it is at the moment, the two years is fixed. Once we get to the end of the two years, that recognition ceases unless we do something in our regulation that would enable them to that to continue. But the, um, the there's no decision made on that. The probably it will be they would have to hold a UK approval. Great, thank you. Um, can an organisation hold a UK CAA? and in the ASA third country camo approval registered in the same address in the UK? Yes, you can hold two approvals. And will the CAA make any changes post transition on the use of, of PMA parts? There's nothing planned at the moment. 
so whatever's in the regulation today is what will be in the regulation as we go into next year um, there is no plan at the moment to look at pma parts could you please clarify a question regarding approved data for modifications stcs if any asa approved mod stc already embodied to one aircraft is amended post the 31st of december 2020 uh 20 yeah, sorry post 31 december 2020 so the end of the transition period to modify for example the ica is this modification applicable to uk camos and g registered aircraft or do we need to use the previous revision of the ica Uh, I would suggest that you'd need to use the latest revision of the ICA. Thanks, Mark. This organisation has an aircraft with an expired ARC issued by France, which is in the UK for transfer to the UK C of A. This work will not be completed prior to the end of the transition period. Will the CAA accept this aircraft for a UK C of A? Uh, yes, but it wouldn't be, we wouldn't be able to revalidate the ARC because it's obviously expired, so it would need to be a uh, full C of A ARC review uh, and, and um, valid transfer documents presented. Does the CAA have a full list of releases that is acceptable to be fitted on G-registered aircraft given the complexity that has been introduced from bilateral agreements, recognition period and CAA policies? They are thinking about uh, something along that lines to answer that question. Um, so that the, the um, you've already seen we've started publishing, uh, started formatting uh, um, flow charts, and the the internal view is we perhaps need to do something uh, similar um, for for to cover the um, uh, working arrangements, bilaterals, etc., as well as the uh, transition period. So it is more than likely that something will be done. Great, uh, thank you. Um, what, uh, can you confirm if an export is required or not for a new aircraft delivered from the EU? It's the understanding of this participant was that one would not be required and that the ASA Form 52 would be accepted as previous. Steve, I'll let you clarify that one, please. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, um, we are continuing to recognise the Form 52 as the, the relevant document. Um, so for going forward for the two year period for new aircraft with a Form 52 um, with some slight amendments to the process, we will not be requiring a, a, an export. Thank you. Um a, a follow-up question here from a previous one. When should an organisation plan to reissue, reprint its fleet's log pages? Does this require direct approval as a change if the format remains largely unchanged? Uh, if there's, a, there's a request here to clarify that, please. Um, yeah, I suppose it would depend largely on uh, how, how quickly you're getting through your log pages, but you, you should look to do something uh, for, for early next year. Thanks, Mark. Does a UK registered aircraft require an UK export CFA to the USA? There is alleviation under FAA order 81302 that it's only desirable. Is it mandatory under the TIP? Uh, does the UK registered aircraft require an export? So yes, you would require an export CFA to the USA. And for a UK organisation with TCO approval, will the regulatory oversight uh, and cost be duplicated? If you hold two approvals, then you will be paying uh, the appropriate fees for each one and the oversight will be done by the appropriate uh, authorities. We have no um, input or control over what EASA may do for their third country approvals. Thanks, Steve. Um, for TC, for type certificate STCs, what about revisions after the 31st of December 2020? I think we've covered this one as another one to follow up, haven't we, Steve? Unless you have anything further to add? I've got nothing further to add, no. And will UKCAA be moving to issue UK TCs for all aircraft? We will. Uh, uh... 
There is a recognition of the um, EASA TCs as we go forward, um, but the as we progress in time, then yes, there, you will start to see uh, CAA UK uh, TCs. Thank you. Uh, this organisation has parts in stock issued with the ASA 21G Form 1s. How long will these parts continue to be accepted for G-registered aircraft? As long as they were that they were, those Form 1s were um, issued uh, before the 31st of December, uh, then uh, there's no problem. Uh, they will continue to be recognised. Um, after the 31st of December, uh, the organisation should be holding uh, a UK approval and using the CIA Form 1 anyway. Great. Um, thank you. I think that's um, that's most of the questions we have um, received over the course of this presentation, giving us five minutes to spare. So I'll give you some of your afternoon back. Um, we did, as you will have noted, if you didn't get your specific question answered, it was because um, they were duplicated throughout the session. But if you do have any follow up questions, uh, you will have noted that there is an email that you can send those to on the invite to which we sent you um, uh, for this particular presentation, and indeed all presentations relating to airworthiness. Um, as I said, at the beginning of this session, we'll be sent will be sharing the slides with you all. Uh, I hope you found this useful. There's further information on our uh, microsite at info.caa.co.uk slash EU exit. Uh, and I'd like to thank Mark, Steve and Stuart for, uh, for giving up their time to talk you through this presentation this afternoon. Many thanks.